this over here. Oops. <laughs> you broke it. Oh. It's, uh... <laughs> it's not open yet. <laughs> what the heck is going on here? A mess. Yeah, that it's is not... ex- exactly right. Recorded live at Talks and Tasting Studios, it's the Clerical Errors Podcast. The podcast that shows you what's behind the collar. Let's go. From the Talks and Tastings Studios, this is the Clerical Errors Podcast, the podcast that shows you what's behind the collar. This is Bullhagen. This is Berg. And this is Vicker. Peter's here. Hey, Pete. Yeah, we got everybody together again. Good. The gang's all here. I think Peter wants to do some alien talk today. We'll see see if we have time. I, I did not say that. <laughs> <laughs> We're eighth commandmenting it to you. Yeah. So. This episode would be out of this world. Hey, we haven't heard from from our, our super fan yet about the Amber Days. How's it shaping up? Oh, yeah. We haven't. Amber hmm. Days, not Amber Days. That makes it oh. sound like a kid is missing. <laughs> well, we do want him to stay alert. <laughs> right. What? Oh, Vicar, I see what you did there. Good work. Good work. Vicar's on fire today. Yeah. Hey, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little more encouragement. You know, every once in a while, I have a random thought. <clears throat> but uh, I remember back in the day, like I had, like on the basketball team, we had, uh, I had a fellow player and a good friend, Haugen, right? Okay, yeah. And every time he would hey, do hey, something. Hang on, hang on. This, this will sound good from back here, right here. Haugen! Oh, Haugen! Right. right. So, I, like, every time he would, it started off with any time he'd some, do something good, right? Mm-hmm. It'd be Haugen. And over time, it like something mediocre, you know? Mm-hmm. Does Haugen. he have a son named Peter Haugen? No. Okay. Uh, he, he, has a, about, he has a son who's a pastor. Talk about James Haugen? That's his son. Okay. Yeah. I know who he is. Yeah. He was the fourth year on my second year. Yeah. Yeah. So his dad. Okay. Haugen. So, so now I'm going to, now you said something, I'm going to say Vicar. <laughs> but it has to be from a distance. Vicar. So super fan. <laughs> uh, by the way, I, I, I'm sorry, listener. I mentioned that before we got started, that might be, I don't know. I'm a little flighty today. I might be bouncing around all, all, all the whole time, so. So it goes. So it goes. So, uh, Berg, what are you drinking there? Oh, what am I drinking? Let's see. <laughs> took a sip a little bit ago and made a face, so it must be something strong. He's already it forgotten. It is Teacher's Highland Cream High Impeded Malt for unique character and full flavor. And it is a blended scotch whiskey, which means that it uses a lot more grain in it, so the flavor profile is not nearly as awesome as a single malt so a little tamed down a little more drinkability yeah well i mean i figure since we're teaching like teachers sounds like a good thing for us right yeah yeah we are what we drink yes which means i'm sparkling (laughs) that is exactly what i would think of you and i'm a kraken bruce (laughs) we do like kraken bruce and what are you vicar that i guess i don't know would that make me let me look at it it'd make you that would make me most Richly flavored. <laughs> wow. That's what they always said about my personality. That's right. So you're just going to just read the label there? I'm, I'm literally just reading the label. How did Bible study go <laughs> this morning? Pete Reek, I guess. It went really well. Got all, yeah. I, I kind of made fun of him after I he plugs his Bible study yeah. af, after church, you know. You know, we have Bible study tomorrow morning. This is what we're talking about. And how did you, exactly did you word it? So we're going through Genesis. 20. Okay, so let's let's take one more step back for the, the listener that isn't okay. part of your congregation. Okay. So Vicar does a morning Bible study on Monday mornings. Yes. Mm-hmm. Do you guys have like a nickname for your little club? The Breakfast no. Club. Like the Breakfast Club or something? No, I should come up with a cool name though. You should. Yeah. We, we've got the Esther Circle. Maybe we should have like the... the it's all the, about branding. The Ezra it, Square It really or is. Yeah. He's, he was promoting his Bible study, which... Yes which is on the next day. And he said, so we're going through Genesis. Uh, Genesis 30 and 31, where it details the birth of Jacob's 12 sons. I said, join us tomorrow where we'll see the birth of Jacob's 12 sons. And I said, wow, all 12 of them, huh? <laughs> yeah. You're, well, it was just another lesson to always watch what I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> right. So uh, uh, what are we preaching on? Burr's excited. This is one of his favorite times of the year. Yeah. Septuagesima. When, when, uh, someday when it, uh, Berg's tombstone is going to say something about pre-Lent. I'm, o- I'm always, you know, pre-Lenting. It's like tailgating. Ooh. 
So our text is Matthew chapter 20. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to him, And to them he said, You go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour he did the same. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, All the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when these when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they were grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day in the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last work as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first and the first last. Thicker! So, uh... You all right? I'm fine. (laughs) Everyone stared at me. So, uh... (laughs) You, are you started host. talking. Yeah, uh, come on. <laughs> talk. You, he All stopped right, so, talking. You went so... And then we're surprised yeah, that the rest of us go-to. looked at you. My, uh, my, my wheels are turning when I say so... When I say so, uh, it doesn't mean I have anything to say yet. It means I'm scrambling. And ah, listener will know. <laughs> I say so... Uh. The fun thing is now with the AI, I'm not sure that so uh will make it through. I think it'll probably just be so. Oh. Because the uh gets cut out by AI, Aww. which is cool. Oh, man. No, oh. that's terrible. Oh. What do you mean? I Makes you guys sound so much smarter. It, But it's it's a bullhaganism. Well, the listener hasn't noticed, or if they have, they haven't told me. So, <laughs> so you, you use AI know. to help you. Hmm. All right, well, let's talk we, about the What do we need text. Vicar for? <laughs> we, don't, <laughs> we don't need to talk about AI. Okay. Let's, <laughs> let's talk about the text. <laughs> Moving on. So, uh... So, uh... <laughs> yeah, I should have been... I don't know what it is today, but I should have been actually thinking about the text where you're reading it. But I will say right. one thing that the highlight <laughs> of, of the text... <laughs> I will uh, say that one of the highlights of the text is the fact that we actually receive the kingdom of heaven by grace. Right? Right. I mean, they were all expecting more based on what? Their works. And it kind of makes the the working of the kingdom as if it's work works righteousness in any way well then you are going to be upset but if it's by grace and you realize well whatever we get is more than we deserve then you won't be upset but is this really comparable to works righteousness because i mean in the end he still gets the denarius he still gets what he's owed yeah I would say. I mean, does did it say the begin with the kingdom of heaven is like? I don't think so. Let me pull it back up. Yeah, it does. See? Okay. Yeah. Um, there are, there are those who like to talk. Uh, many who actually like to talk about this when it comes to uh, election and predestination that uh, uh, we are not predestined to damnation. That is because of our own sinful nature. That God desires all to be saved. At the same time, we are saved by his grace alone, so we can't take credit for that either. Mm -hmm. What do you got, Berg? All right. Yeah, and that would be based on that last verse, right? Many are called, but few are chosen, right? Mm Mm-hmm. So anyway, what does this text teach us? Well, I think part of it is, is that man actually wants to work. Right. Right? Man was created to work. I mean, the way in which the kingdom of heaven is described is like being a worker, a worker in a vineyard. You're working for somebody. Man wants to work. We see this even before the fall into sin, Genesis 2.15, where what? why is man put in the garden? To work. To, to work and, and keep it or tend it, right? And how is that, uh, the kingdom of heaven described? You know, you know uh, the best examples we have of what heaven is like when people ask you, well, it's a lot like church, <laughs> a lot of praising, a lot of singing, huh. and you're well, going to be working. <laughs> you know, yeah. and the words here are avad, to work or to worship, which in Hebrew means the same thing in like Genesis 2.15. And then shamar, 
to keep or to watch, right? All of those things are things that we do. Man actually wants to work. Nobody wants to be idle. This is why, you know, you suffer from ADHD, right? Sometimes. I'm not convinced. You, like, yeah, you're not. <laughs> but you want to do stuff, right? Yeah. Right? Everybody yeah. wants to do stuff. They want to do stuff that's meaningful. They want to, you know, I mean, honestly, it's kind of sad when the owner of the vineyard goes into the marketplace and is like, why are you guys here? And he's like, because no one's hired us. Like, being idle is terrible. And, Nobody and the wants fact, to be idle. And the fact that that this is why it goes back to grace again is because as a child of God, you see it as a joy to serve. Right, not, right. Not that you would enjoy it, but but it's kind of like being a, a parent. There's lots of things you do as a parent that you really don't want to do, but you're driven to do it because uh, of the love that you have for the child. And this whole discussion that you have makes it seem as though working for the sake of the kingdom is just treudgery. Like it wasn't worth it because I didn't get anything out of it. Or right, I gave, which is and a I, false, and my, I, I gave which is the a church and wasted my work. money. Right. That's what it is, right? So, I mean, the way I would preach this is, is, you know, man wants to work, God wants man to work, and then work is rewarded by grace. Because those who seek more, those who are measuring themselves by work righteousness, what do they complain about? The heat of the day, right? right. right. They, don't, they don't complain about, you know, him being unequal. They're like, well, oh, we've borne you know, the burden of this, the turmoil. And it's like, no, this man actually wants to work. Man was created before the fall to work. God actually, in his grace, allows us to work in his vineyard. Yeah, it's kind of like when people talk about dying penniless, you know, they say, oh, this man died penniless. Well, that was actually just good timing. You got to enjoy <laughs> everything, right? Right. You couldn't take it with them. And this this takes a view of... The person who is called at the end of the day, here you got to do whatever you wanted, to live however you wanted as though that was a good thing, and you get the same thing. So, I yeah, I mean, like, but it's, yeah, and this is where, do you begrudge my generosity? Bad translation. It should be translated literally. Is your eye evil because I am good? Much more powerful. Right. Are our eyes evil because God is good? And I mean, that is quite an accusation. It's quite a damnation of us and condemnation, right? Mm -hmm. Because yeah, how, how, how would that, for example, how would this all address someone say, well, I should have more standing because, you know, my great great grandparents started that church? Or, you know, I mean, who is this parable really? You know, we always like to see ourselves as the hero in all of Jesus' stories, right? Yeah. I mean, or, really, right? We want to see ourselves as the hero. No, and no, no, that's no, no, where, no, no. Right? I mean, no, 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 we, no, no. I what do you, you want to see wrong. yourself? No, no. What do you want to see yourself as? No, do you no, want to see yourself as the, as the prodigal? No, you're wrong. You're wrong. This is how really? people... Yes, yes. For example, people like to see themselves as, for example, the publican as opposed to the Pharisee in the right. Lutheran church because... Uh, they're the ones who are the super sinner. And if, right. Right. So they don't like to see them as, maybe we're saying the same thing. We are saying the same thing, right? <laughs> we either want to see ourselves as the victim or as the hero, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm the publican. Or, oh, yeah, I'm the younger prodigal brother. Or, oh, yeah, I'm the tax collector. Well, who is this parable really right. told to? Those who are baptized as babies. Right. Honestly, this parable is told to people who have been in the church all of their lives, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's told to them saying, look, don't despise the grace of God. Don't let your eye be evil because God is good, because God desires the salvation of all, because all of these things are done by his grace, even your, even your work, which is what we pray for, right? Establish thou the work of our hands upon us, as in Psalm 90, right? I have, I have so, a question. Yeah. Do you think this, this parable could be also be taken from kind of a longer view, meaning a, a Jew-Gentile thing? You know, uh, I think so. But yeah. that's the yeah. problem is like we can, t you know, I mean, what was the problem with the Jews? Well, they rejected Christ. Yeah, but they'd also been Jews all their lives. I mean, 
They weren't like our ancestors sacrificing babies to trees and rocks. Right. I mean, right. let's be honest. Like, our ancestors were awful people. And yet they rejected their dark, heathenistic evil and received Christ. And that's beautiful, right? We should mm-hmm. rejoice in that. And so, but we are like the Jews in that we have actually grown up with the oracles of God. We are the ones who have actually received it. Right. Right? Right. And like, I mean. But I, I could see how early Christianity, how this could be viewed in a, in a powerful way of 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 the Judaizers and the, the Gentiles coming in. We've done all the work. We've done the one, ones by whom God has given the seed and the promise of the seed and kind of bore the brunt of that. Uh, and and I'm al- sure... And I'm sure in its original context, that's that's exactly what it was, right? Because right. Jesus was chastising the Jewish church for caring more about its blood and more about its inheritance and more about, oh, well, we've always been in the covenant. Why should these Gentiles, these proselytes ever get in? Why should they get as much as us? Right. And isn't that our fault today? Yeah. I mean, really, like, You know, oh, I've been slaving away in the kingdom all this time, 80 some years. And oh, you know, this a-hole of a neighbor who lets his dog poop on my lawn and, you know, fornicated his way through college and smokes a bunch of dope. Oh, he suddenly come to the light. Yeah. Right. (laughs) I mean, that's really what this is, right? Mm -hmm. Why should he get what I have? Well, because it's all by grace. Nobody deserves anything anyway. Yeah. Right? I mean. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we got. That's what this is. That's what's beautiful about this, right? Yeah. Is that the people at the 11th hour who have one hour to work, who have one hour to beat back the chaos by the word of God to establish good habits, things like, you know, not just the gospel, but also like orders of creation who expel demons by speaking the word of God and the like, like they are included in the kingdom. Their work matters. People like the thief on the cross are at the 11th hour, and that's wonderful, and it's beautiful. And, and also a reminder to us to, to continue to call them. Yeah, and nobody gives a crap if your dad built the church. I don't even care that you've been a member for 80 years. Do you actually believe? Or do you think that because you've been a member for 80 years that you deserve something? Yeah. And the answer is no. Is your eye evil because I am good? Can I not choose to do what I want with my own things? Yep. God is God. So. Got anything to say, Vicar? No, I think you pretty well hit everything. All right. Yeah, thanks for your confirmation on what Berg said, Vicar. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he doesn't want to uh, <laughs> confirm what I said. <laughs> Vicar! <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> you said it all, Berg. Well, you know. I, c- just, I could be like uh, how they do at the seminary when you don't really like the, the student's sermon. You go, well, you had a great text. Right. Yeah. Uh, oh, man. Impeccable Vicar. presentation. <laughs> <laughs> the preacher had a great personality. That's right. The hymns were good. You had a strong start. <laughs> Aw, you had come great on, pauses. Vicar. We wish they were longer. <laughs> <laughs> I could uh, be a jerk and just pause till the end of the episode. This is why I could never teach homiletics because you'd be goofing on them too too long. Yeah, I would be like, get did you goes. really do that? Did you really have your hand signal scripted? <laughs> Tell yes. me you didn't. Yes. I remember when I was in homiletics once, the guy had had all his hand signals scripted, like like which ones to do when in the sermon, and he forgot one. He went back two lines so he could re say it with the hand actions. <laughs> that's like that's like playing a piece with the orchestra, missing a note, and then the one going, the one dude that missed the note having to go back and do it again, while everybody else just keeps going. No, no, no. It's uh, it's uh, going back. Uh, because you didn't smile right while you were playing the note. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, oh, good times. Oh, so uh, we should get the campfire going. 
Uh, <laughs> that Listen campfire. That so yeah, it's a nice, <laughs> nice fire. Nice fire. Keeping warm. Warm and cozy. Peter, play the intro. Gather around, everyone. Time for campfire catechesis. It's a nice fire, isn't it? Very warm. <laughs> yeah. A little catechesis going on by the fire. It's a little warmer. A little warm front finally came through. Yeah. Yeah. Finally double digits. What kind of fire do you have going there out there, Berg? The big rock candy mountain kind. Oh. So, uh, you want people to listen to that song? I do. I didn't mention it during the uh, the thing. So, oh. the end. The end. So, uh, what is your campfire catechesis on, Berg? Well, I mean, this kind of gets us into... The request we've gotten for five minutes on sects, that is, factions. And of so, you know, I wanted to do this on marriage because there are some factions in Christian in Christianity that want to talk about, you know, marriage as a sacrament, who should marry, to which state should this, should marriage belong, et cetera, et cetera. So with that being said... Let's get into it. Vicar, you got any comments? None so far. Was there another All intro right. that I should that I need <laughs> no. to know about? Yeah. Okay. Do you do you approve of this topic? <laughs> this is Vicar and I approve of this topic. <laughs> there we go. All right. So let's start with marriage. I mean, it's kind of a big deal because, you know, marriage is kind of a big deal. And so it's kind of important to know where does it belong? Does it belong in the civil estate? Because the civil estate has recent, you know, within what, I don't know. It's actually been more than like half a decade. Now we're coming up on a decade of, you know. We're coming up on about a decade now of gay marriage, which isn't a thing. It's like saying that, Vicar, Vicar, do you remember how old you were when, when you were when gay marriage was legalized? Wasn't it 2008 when it was legalized? I don't know. It was after I was a pastor, so. Okay. Okay. So, anyway, where does marriage belong? Does it belong in the church? Does it belong in the state? Does it belong in the family? So, first thing I want to talk about here is marriage is worldly. It does not belong in the power of bishops, which deals with the conscience and with eternal things. And we see this in Romans fourteen seventeen: The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Luke twelve fourteen, where Jesus says to the man who asks him about uh, forcing his brother to share his inheritance with him, man who made me a judge or arbitrator over you. And in John eighteen thirty six, Jesus answered, Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I would not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Another way that we know that marriage is not in the realm of the church, is that marriage ends in death, and therefore it is only for this world. Romans 7, 2 through 3, For the woman who has a husband is bound by law to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress, but if her husband dies, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. And then, Matthew 22, verses 28 through 29. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. So that is the scriptural basis for why marriage is a worldly thing. There are also confessional uh, quotations here that I want to talk about that show that marriage belongs to either the realm, the domestic realm, or the civil realm. So, Article AC, that is Augsburg Confession, 16 of civil affairs, it is right for a Christian to bear civil office, to sit as judges, to judge matters by the imperial and other existing laws, to award just punishments, to engage in just wars, to serve as soldiers, to make legal contracts, to hold property, to make an oath when required by the magistrates, to marry a wife, 
to be given in marriage. So there, that shows that marriage belongs to the civil affairs according to our confessions. Same thing. But, but I want to point out, given to the civil affairs still by God, though. Yeah. Yeah, obviously. Right. Our, in Augsburg Confession 28 of the Power of Bishops, if they, that is the bishops, have any other power or jurisdiction in hearing and judging certain cases as of matrimony or of tithes, etc., they have it by human right, in which matters princes are bound even against their will when the ordin- ordinaries fail to dispense justice to their subjects for the maintenance of peace. So matrimony here belongs to what? The civil realm, which are given to the bishops not by divine right, but by human right. Right. So it's kind of like that they sign off and give it to the church. R- right. I mean, it's by human right. So, like, who should really do it? And we'll get into that in Luther's uh, rebukes of the state, right? Mm-hmm. All right. So, primacy and power of the Pope, paragraph 77. There remains the jurisdiction in those cases which, according to canonical law, pertain to the ecclesiastical court, as they call it, and especially in cases of matrimony. This, too, the bishops have only by human right, which is exactly what was said in the Augsburg Confession 28, and that not a very old one, as appears from the Codex and the Novella of Justinian, that that decisions concerning marriage at that time belonged to the magistrates, And by divine right, worldly magistrates are compelled to make decisions if the bishops just judged unjustly or are negligent. The canons can also concede the same. Therefore, also on account of this jurisdiction, it is not necessary to obey bishops. So those are our confessional writings, and that's the Bible, right? Mm -hmm. Marriage, while informed by the word of God as a divine institution, still belongs either to the domestic estate, which belongs to the mother and father, or to the civil estate, which is the magistrate, which actually flows out of the family, as Luther's large catechism says on the fourth commandment. So we've made it clear that you can't just have a church wedding and not a civil one. Right? right, right. Okay. As long so as the we're whole, all the on whole, the same uh, well, we're page. married in God's eyes, but not in the state's eyes. That doesn't right. Exist. You that can't doesn't have a exist. Marriage. Right, and that's exactly what we're talking about here. Okay. So uh, number forty-seven, sixteen. Do marriages? Do marriage cases belong to the church? July twenty-third, fifteen thirty-nine. This is part of what Luther talks about. In his table talk. So it says, We asked him, that is Martin Luther, what pastors should do in marriage cases, whether we can with a good conscience stay away from these troublesome things. He replied, It is my advice that we should by no means take this yoke upon ourselves. First, we have enough work in our proper office. Second, marriage is outside the church, is a civil matter, and therefore should belong to the government. Third, These cases have no limits, extend to the height, the breadth, and the depth, and produce many offenses that bring disgrace to the gospel. I know how often we have been put to shame with our advice in these matters, when to prevent future evil we allowed secret acts, just so they were kept secret so as not to be made an example. But people treat us unkindly and draw us into wicked affairs. If things don't turn out well, the blame must be ours entirely. Accordingly, we prefer to leave this business to civil officials. The responsibility rests on them. If they do well, it's all the better for them. Only in cases, cases of conscience should pastors give counsel to godly people. Controversies and court cases we leave to lawyers and consistories. Dr. Killian wished to impose upon on us ministers the hearing and examination of cases, after which we should await the decisions of the lawyers. I was against this and suggested that the lawyers hear the cases and look to us for decisions. Master Philip persuaded Master Calarius and me for the time being that we should serve our lacerated churches in such cases. 
So this is Luther speaking at the table about what the estate of marriage is, that it is a worldly thing. And again, in the next one... By, by the way, which then also, uh, I think a common misunderstanding is the fact that that automatically would assume that a marriage is something that the whole of society should be concerned about. Meaning uh, what I and, and this other person do in our personal life doesn't matter to anybody else. Well, then why is it a civil thing? Yeah, Why does it matter not, to the government at all? Or why does it matter, matter to a family at all? Because we're not Ron Swanson. We're not Ron's libertarians. Like, we actually live in a society with other people. Is that, is that who Ron Swanson is? Yeah, from Parks and Rec. Okay. So you, you could even name that this episode. Surely. That. Okay, hang on. I haven't watched Park and Rec before. You'll recognize the face, I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, okay. That guy. Yeah. It seems like every seminary class has someone who looks like that guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have too many libertarians in our midst. <laughs> this like, most certainly is true. Marriage affects society. That's why, what did the gays argue when they wanted to get married? Oh, it's just for us. Now what are we doing? Mutilating children and adults? Right. We cannot say that these things do not have an impact on our society. And our children. And our children. And ourselves. Like, we're going to say we're not actually swayed by these things in some way, shape, or form, even if it's a little bit. It, it's kind of kind of like our discussion when we that we had in our discussion on why do we have a synod of well these are obvious reasons why we have a synod you know for example make sure we have well trained pastors and well why do you have a marriage we've gotten away from that yeah there is no society without marriage there just isn't which is why even fornicating people talk about their beloved as being married. I know this from experience. You either have to talk about it this way or you're just a complete jerk who wants to take advantage of them until they're no longer useful to you. Right, when, what does the biblical, the Bible say? Husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. I mean, let's be honest here. Like, yes, love your wives. Love the ladies you've impregnated. Love your own flesh, because that's what this is. No man hateth his own flesh, but loveth and cherisheth it. That's what the apostle says. So, I don't know, let's be godly? Because there's no society without marriage. Like, the family is society in a microcosm. When kids fight, what do mom and dad do? Teach them. Right. Oh, I like to watch them fight a little bit. Like, <laughs> well, Yeah, of course. I mean, why not? Like right? there was, Yeah, I had a lot of joy in watching the two young boys, the youngest, wrestle. But that's not fighting. That's true. Every once in a while, they would be in the, in the living room, and i just go, ding, ding. <laughs> Which is good. I mean, like, there should be heiress or strife among... Men of society, right? Right. It was done in love. You remember yeah, that, I, Pete, don't you? Right? Yeah, I remember. <laughs> Everybody involved was having a great time. <laughs> yeah. No betting was going on or anything. Well, most of the time. Yeah. So, are we con convinced that, like, marriage is a worldly thing? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, Luther continues and he says, like, no, therefore, that marriage is an outward bodily thing like the other worldly undertaking, just as I may eat, drink, sleep, walk, ride with, buy from, speak to, and deal with a heathen, Jew, Turk, or heretic, so I may also marry and continue in wedlock with him. And that is from Luther's Works, Volume 45, The Christian Society, Number 2. So, I mean, like... Marriage does not belong to the church. It is an outward, earthly, worldly thing. It has can God's I, can commandment. I, can, I, can we compare this to another, just for example's sake, to help people clarify this in their minds? So, Please. 
Th th another example would be, let's take a uh, vicar. Pick stealing or murder. Pick one. Murder. Murder. Yeah, I feel you go there. I knew it. <laughs> You'd say that if I picked stealing. <laughs> so you like murder, huh? I see. Um, so who would you murder? So, so my what I was gonna say is obviously. He was gonna answer. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Go ahead. So when you when you're looking at those, who who is it that should punish murder? The state. The state. Does that mean that the church doesn't care about that? No. I mean. It's still a commandment. Is it still an issue that deals with people's souls and life? Yes. But is, should the church be in a position of saying uh, how murder trials should be done, how they should be punished? No. Or, no, because that, that's, a, that's a function that falls within human right rather than divine right. That being said, if murder is happening and nothing's being done by the government, should the church do something and say something? Yes. Yes. Is that, is that a good way to think about it, Berg? Yeah, I mean, Luther says it in On Marriage Matters, volume 46, page 265. No one can, den can deny that marriage is an external worldly matter like clothing and food, house and property, subject to temporal authority, as the many imperial laws en enacted on the subject prove. Neither do I find any example in the New Testament where, the, where Christ or the apostles concern themselves with such matters, except where they touched upon consciences, as did St. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 24. Got it. So, like, with marriage, where does it belong? Belongs to the state. Does it? That's what you just told us. Well, uh, I'm so confused. I knew it. I knew this was coming. Ha! I didn't say it out loud, but I knew this was coming. Oh, he did a rope a <laughs> So, who does it belong to? Jesus. <laughs> the old Sunday school course. answer. <laughs> well, you're not wrong. <laughs> so, I mean, let's let's be honest. Like, who does it belong to? It belongs to the family. It belongs to the domestic estate. We see this in Genesis chapter 24, verse 4, where... Abraham commands his servant, but you shall go to my country and to my family and find a wife for my son Isaac. Right? Mm -hmm. And then once again, we see here is Rebecca before you. Take her and go and let her be your master's son's wife as the Lord has spoken. And again, in Genesis 29, 16, 19 through 21. And Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to another man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed only a few days to him because of the love he had for her. And then, you know, it continues on. So, but 1 Corinthians 7, verses 36 and 37 also talks about this, right? Mm -hmm. But if any man thinks that he is be behaving improperly towards his virgin, if she has passed the flower of youth, and thus it must be, let him do what he wishes. He does not sin, let them marry. Nevertheless, he who stands steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but has power over his own will, and has so determined in his heart that he will keep his virgin, does well. So, I mean, all of this really does fall within the domestic estate. The government is an extension of the domestic estate. At least it should be, okay? They have the right and the duty of regulating marriage for the purpose of inheritance, protection, forbidden marriages due to consanguiny, which is being too closely related, and to the preservation of chastity. So, for example, Numbers 36, Zephalad and his daughters, Ruth 4, the elders of the city, the ruling body, were witnesses of Boaz's redemption of Ruth. Or Exodus 21, verses 7 through 11. And if a man sells his daughter to be a female slave, she shall not go out as the male slaves do. But if she does not please her master, who has betrothed her to himself, then he shall let her be redeemed. He shall have no right to sell her to a foreign people, since he has dealt deceitfully with her. And if he has betrothed her to his son, 
he shall deal with her according to the custom of daughters. If he takes another wife, he shall not diminish her food, her clothing, and her marriage rights. And if he does not do these three for her, then she shall go out free without paying money. So that's the thing. The government is there to regulate marriage, not really to create it. So basically, the church's job is to teach what marriage is. Marriage is God's institution. What marriage is for, the procreation of children, mutual love and companionship, and a way to harness sinful passions. The church also gives counsel and good advice to the magistrate and to the parents, especially in cases of conscience on the basis of God's word. The government is there to regulate marriage. It is not there to create marriage. It is not there to create false forms of marriage. It should be based on the word of God. So really, what does marriage belong to? Marriage belongs to the the domestic estate. You should really ask your parents to get married before you actually engage yourself to someone who may or may not be very good to you. So, Yep, I did that way back when. I did it too. That is a good thing. So, Shout out to Dave. I mean, you know, well, and did your potential father-in-law have rules for you? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, he was clear about On his what, rules. Yeah. Which is good. I mean, really, this should be handled between families. The state should really only get involved when it becomes an issue of too close of consu- consanguinity, right. right? Right. But, you, hey, know, there, you know, there are times, it's kind you know, of a power, power move, though, when I think back. Because, like, I asked, you know, and I knew in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, you know, like, you want to keep her, really? <laughs> ha! That's terrible. But, yeah, I mean, <laughs> you sure? <laughs> you just like to barter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was kind of a boss move on my part. So, I mean, really, like, all three states should be involved, right? The church should should teach what marriage is and why you want it. The government should make sure that, like, I don't know, you're not brother and sister in getting married. Yep, that I believe that is true. That would be El Bado, right? Right. That would create quite an awkward 23 and Me situation. Now, of course, does the government fall down on its job? Yeah, absolutely, right? Mm Mm-hmm. So what should you do? That's a broad question. I don't know, go with your conscience, which has been informed by the, I don't know, word of God? Right. Another thing that happens is there are times where where a pastor will say, uh, yeah, maybe... You should deal with some things before you have a wedding in the church. Exactly. The well, are we I mean, saying let's... that are we say completely forbidding them from getting married? No, we're not. Not at all. In fact, and, you don't even have to. You could just go to the Methodist church will marry anybody. So you can always well, do that. Go to the courthouse. Right. And get married. Yeah, or I'm in Iowa, kidding. it's very easy. Right. Just declare publicly that you are a man and wife, right? Yeah, jump over a broom or something. Well, which, thank you, Peter. I really appreciate that because I think common law marriage is actually one of the best ways to teach that marriage actually belongs in the home. Fathers and mothers must give their consent. Husband and wives must give their consent. If there's nothing impeding that, boom, you're married. Boom, no marriage. cohabitation, no nonsense, get her done. So, so, so when someone says views cohabitation as, in a sense, a common law marriage, how would you how how would you confront that? First of all, I would say it's not a marriage because neither party recognizes it recognizes it as a marriage. 
And this, the state of Iowa is actually very clear on this point, which is actually a wonderful thing. <laughs> they actually call people to repentance on this. Like, if you don't file your taxes together, if you don't act like you're a married couple, you're not a married, cu- married couple. The state actually does a better job of it than we do. And there is no time in which you have to cohabitate in Iowa before you become a married couple. That's weird. I almost wish my wife and I would have done it. Just to prove, like, you don't need a marriage license. Marriage licenses are something that the Church of England came up with in order for you to get married in the Church of England. Common law marriage. Say that that one more time. So, Common law marriages were basically made illegal by the Church of England so that way you would get married by a Church of England priest or the like. This is why Scottish people would talk about marriages as being jumping the broom, which is something that Peter brought up before. These were common law marriages, which were very, very, what do I want to say, natural. No, natural. Like, because what is marriage? Lutheran Lutherans have always taught since Kretzmann that what makes a marriage a marriage? The promise that you will be my wife or my husband until you die. Which means that engagement is technically marriage. You are making a promise that you are going to marry this person. So what about a promise ring that I promise with this promise ring that we will at some point be engaged, which at some point we will be married? I've always taken promise rings to mean that they, you know, you're going to be chased until, you know. Right. Marriage, which if you need that reminder, good on you. Okay. Can I say something that's always bothered me a little bit? Okay. Please. Go ahead. Is that is that we treat dating the same way? If you are like not if, dating to get married, you shouldn't no, be dating. No, no, my my point is is uh like why what's wrong with dating more than one person at a time? Nothing. Right. Is it there's that nothing way? there's nothing You're trying wrong to figure with that. figure it out, yeah. I mean most people do that anyway now, so Really? Yeah, I well, mean, it's pretty, there's pretty common talking they refer to it as talking, right? And then when you're like then going you steady exclusive. or whatever, then yeah. you're exclusive. Oh. Okay, so so Bullhagen, you know, there's a difference between dating and going steady. Okay, all right. right? It's been a while since I've been in this this <laughs> realm. <laughs> See, I started dating uh, Mrs. Bullhagen. Uh, at that point, it was Miss Hine. Uh, let's see. I think our first date was in '89. That sound right? No, 90. I think it was 90. So it's been a while. Well, and that's the thing is like, if you want to get married, talk to your parents because they have authority over you for the fourth commandment. And also they can see things that maybe you don't see. And that might actually be helpful. For, you know, that might be helpful to you in the long run, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's something to keep in mind because you'd rather not have marriage be more of a cross to you than a benefit. It, yeah, it's a blessing. It's a gift. It should be a blessing and a gift. So, and if it's not, then don't do it. All right. Good job. Interesting. Vicar, if someone has questions about this, where can they get a hold of us? They can email us at feedback at clericalheirs.org. You mm-hmm. can also find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash clericalheirs. Mm-hmm. And they can find us on X. Uh, X me, bro. At clericalheirs P. Yes. If you ever want to X us a question. <laughs> if you want to In... Xberg on sects. <laughs> it's making <sighs> Berg uncomfortable. On his, on, what word did you use? Sectarian? Is that what you said? Factions. 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 Yeah. And, by the way, we did get some emails. Uh, there's a, 
uh, Reverend uh, Michael Moore, who gave us um, comment that <laughs> there is a whole Bible study. Uh, it's called The Lutheran Difference, and it's an entire series of topics that uh, di- differentiates the Lutheran faith from other churches. So I um, want to give a plug to our listeners. And and then also we have one uh, that someone... Well, and it's from CPH too, right? Yes. yes. Yeah, it's a CPH thing. Yes. So we should like post that on our deal, right? Yes. Uh, Yeah, I'll post it in the link dump. All right. And uh, another listener uh, says, Pastor Berg, please do one of these segments. This information is generally needed on so m- greatly needed on so many levels. My favorite part qu- quote of la- last week, as said by Vicar, boom, periodical. Vicar, <laughs> um, boom, periodical. So, uh, Peter, you, you, I have a question for Berg now. Moving on to a different topic. What about aliens? What estate do aliens fall under? <laughs> They fall under the demonic estate, so we don't have to talk about them. Okay. But what if I wanted to marry an alien? Don't Um, do it, man. Don't do it. I'll make them legal. That's a... (laughs) Ha! (laughs) Make it... Yeah, first you... Before you marry an alien, first you you have to phone home. Hey, Dad, can I marry an alien? (laughs) First you have to phone home. It's an E.T. joke, people. I got it. Okay. (laughs) I understand. Oh, I think I we're do. I think we're done. <laughs> All right. Well, it's gonna be a little short, but I think we're done. Well, it's a little short, but last line was long, so that's right. Yeah. Well, this will end our show. Thank you for listening. Uh, I am Bullhagen. I am Berg, and I'm Vicar. And may your marital estate be in the heat of the day. Thank you for joining us. This podcast is available on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Questions, thoughts, concerns? You can contact us on Facebook at facebook.com slash clerical errors podcast, on Twitter at clerical errors P for podcast, or email us at feedback at clerical Thanks for listening to clerical errors. See you next time.